there's so much desire for Christians to share with non-Christians about Jesus that the message gets changed at times and rearranged into ways that maybe maybe the fruit of it isn't such a good thing. I know that one time I did a study on you know what is the gospel? You know, what is what is the good news and how do you share it? And you know, where did this idea of four spiritual laws come from? Because there aren't four spiritual laws. It just there isn't. You can look in the Bible. There's there's no place that it says there's four spiritual laws. It's an idea. It's something that came about. Actually, I think Bill Bright might have been the one who first thought of it. it. Was back in Campus Crusade for Christ when he started sharing with people that were on community colleges as well as universities and junior colleges. He began to run into people that didn't really have a Christian background. They didn't understand the reality of what sin was and what being distant from God meant and how God, by way of His perfect plan, would cause people to come to Him and they would choose Him. So he, he developed, I believe, as a seminary student or as a Bible student that... Um, whole idea of the four spiritual laws and then put it together in a simple little packet and when it first came out that was kind of like the, the big deal of the Jesus movement was that it's a fact that you are a sinner, it's a fact that you know Christ died for you, it's a fact that you know you need to be forgiven, it's a fact that you know God has made a way of salvation. I mean, yeah, but there's more than that. You know, if there's four spiritual laws, then why not eight? Why not ten or twelve? Because sometimes the convenience of using some of these tools gives the wrong impression about what reality is, you know, when it comes to walking with God. I kind of like, I hate the idea of what people have changed it into, but I love the idea when Purpose Driven Life first came out. It was this whole idea of people got involved, you know, and they began to discover that first of all, God is alive, you know, that he's real. And then they discover in the book that, you know, he's got a plan for your life. and that you have to give control of your life over to God and it lines out the entire plan of salvation and it's done not in a short, you know, let's bombard you with sin, you're a sinner, you're yes, this, that, and the other thing you got ready before and now you're coming up and you're going to get saved today. But, you know, you went through this process of learning and developing and thinking and I think that's what's getting forgotten about Christianity today is that it costs something. You know, you're you're making a conscious choice to go a different direction. Is that it's not a matter of just simply finding out how God's going to make your life better, but it's giving up your life to get his life, which might be better. Because anything could be better than what you're living in, because a lot of times most people find themselves in sin and stuck and messed up, but by the time they get around to talking with God, they're they're willing to do anything to get saved, but then they kind of, a lot of people just don't really go much farther. And in devotionals today with Tozer, or with Tozer, he's discussing this whole idea of people making a commitment to get something, but not to be something, to acquire something, but not to have to give up something, to get and not give, to be and not pay the price. In other words, Jesus gave a very simple message, but it's kind of not mentioned much nowadays when it comes to presenting the gospel. He said, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. Boy, in those days, I mean, people kind of like, you know, oh, really? I mean, they seem to have a better understanding of denial in the East than they seem to do in the West, because in Western culture, it's about what we get, not what we give. In the Eastern culture, it's more about what they give, not what they get. The idealism and the realism somehow just don't balance out between East and West. Because the real aspects of who Jesus is and what he's saying to you is that he is saying, look, if you're going to come to me, if you're going to 
discover this process of salvation, this whole thing that I've done for you, that I've died for you, that I've given my life up for you, that I've laid down my life, you too must do what I have done. You must lay down your life for your brethren. You must deny yourself. You must take up your cross. You must follow me. Otherwise, I don't know who you are. And that's part of where maybe Christianity, you know, has gotten a little bit off track on not really sharing that until after you get saved and then down the road in discipleship saying, well, you know, you kind of need to, you know, like deny yourself too. Oh, now you tell me. You see, it's not about a bed of roses. It's about the reality check of being truthful. And if you don't know that there's a cross that you're going to die on, then you probably haven't been given a real good appreciation of what Jesus has said to you. Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, will tell you exactly how you have to be. And you can't do it. But you have to be that way in order to be accepted in God's sight. So Jesus says, I will make you into this if you want to go this route. But know this, if you don't, here's the consequences and here's what the results are if you do. So if you want to be stupid and you want to stumble over your own feet, go ahead. If you want to be smart and you want to learn how to walk, follow me. And when he said, follow me, he said, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Do not mistake the true meaning of the cross, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Galatians 6.14 All unannounced and mostly undetected, there has come in modern times a new cross into popular evangelical circles. It is like the old cross, but different. The likenesses are superficial, the difference is fundamental. From this new cross has sprung a new philosophy of the Christian life with encouragement for a new, entirely different evangelistic approach. The evangelist tries to show that Christianity makes no unpleasant demands. Rather, it offers the same thing the world does, but only on a higher level. Be the best you can be and God will make you into the Christian jock star because you already are. He'll make you into the Christian movie star because you want to be. He'll make you into the Christian worship leader because that's what you want to be. He'll make you into the Christian pastor because that's what you've always wanted to be. He'll make you the Christian superstar, the Christian American idol, the Christian baseball player, the Christian acrobat, the Christian, Christian, Christian. But I don't see too many that are saying, I'm going to become, when I grow up, I want to be a Christian martyr. That's what Jesus was. He was a martyr. He died. I don't see anyone jumping up and saying, hey, I want to be a Christian missionary and go to unexplored territories and peoples that have never heard the gospel that might just kill me. Hmm. I think that's what Through the Gates of Splendor was all about. Giving up a rising football star and everything else or you know, promising sports career in order to be a missionary. I don't think we understand the gospel anymore. So maybe the new cross is just you get to be what you want to be and you throw Christian on top of it. Maybe Jesus gave his life up so that you could have your life the way you want it to be. So that you get all your blessings now. And maybe you do. But can I let you in on a secret? If you've been seen a man, if you've been acknowledged as, oh, the Christian movie star, the Christian worship leader, the Christian football star, the Christian baseball star, you already got your reward. You ain't going to get anything in heaven. Because frankly, the accolades of men, once you've received them, are your reward. Because it's not about what people see, but it's really about what you do that makes you a Christian. So I wouldn't be too comfortable with this cross that people seem to have that and now it lays down on the side. It's like we're crossing over the bridge of the cross. We're, you know, we're using the cross as a bridge to get from point A to point B. We're using the cross and laying it down as floating on the waves. You know, I see this on the internet all the time. They put the cross down and they have 10 people standing on top of it. 
or they put the cross down and they have people walking over it like a bridge. They don't treat the cross like a bloody instrument for the death of the flesh that is causing you to stop from going to heaven because your flesh cannot go and exist in the same place that God is. So thank God that there's a cross that you need to die on so that you would no longer live after your own flesh and desires and wants, but rather live after God. I wonder. What kind of cross do you bear? Or is your cross around your neck? And you're not carrying it. Because if it's right here, and that's all it is, it's just a decorative instrument with which you have added to your job vocation, your career objectives, all these other things that you've laid down, I question whether or not you are a Christian because I really want to know whether or not Jesus told you to do what you're doing or you've just added him as an afterthought. The philosophy back of this kind of thing may be sincere, but it is as false as it is blind. It misses completely the whole meaning of the cross. The old cross is a symbol of death. It stands for abrupt, violent end of a human being. In Roman times, the man who took up his cross and started down the road was not coming back. He was not going out to have his life redirected. He was going to how to have it ended. Everyone knew that once he took up his cross, he was going to die. The cross did not try to keep on good terms with its victim. It struck cruel and hard, and when it had finished its work, the man was no more. The race of Adam is under a death sentence. God cannot approve any of the fruits of sin. In coming to Christ, we do not bring our old life up into a higher plane, but we leave it at the cross. Thus, God salvages the individual by liquidating him and then raising him again to a newness of life. The choice is really yours to figure out with you and God, one-on-one, -on -one, what he wants you to do. You can tell me, you know, till the cows come home, what he wants you to do. But I don't matter much to the long and short of it when it comes to eternal destiny of where you're going to go and what you're going to be and how you're going to feel once you arrive there. But I know this, the things of the world are not the things of God. What you look at over here as accomplishments for God, God does not look at as being an accomplishment in the kingdom of heaven. He has a different standard and a different criteria with which he wants to deal with you on. But the only way you really get to that place of understanding how he sees things is by dying to yourself. The biggest problem every Gentile has, every Christian in America has, everyone you and I have, is pride, arrogance, and selfishness because we're self-centered. Americans are a very self-centered people. They're not about denying itself. They're willing to give out of their abundance. But are they willing to lay down their life? Because Jesus laid down his life for the sins of the entire world, including the Roman emperor that were evil, including the procurator that was in charge of Israel at the time, including the violent men that were Jewish that were zealots, including his own disciples who denied him, including every single human being that ever lived. Wow. When you think of it that way, would you want to carry a cross like that? Not me. But you know what? I don't want to carry his cross. But I sure wouldn't mind, like, becoming like him, Christ-like, Christian. But I think the only way I'm going to be able to do that is if I take up my cross and follow him.